case is uh, which case will be started? Case one, Chavo. Case one, which will be presented by uh, Ottawa, correct? Uh, no, no, my my case. Your case, okay. Sounds good. Um, all right. We just have two minutes more, then start. Inshallah, we'll give two more minutes and then we'll uh, get started. Thank you very much, everybody, for your patience. All right, it's five minutes after two, so we'll get started. Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and uh, welcome to our uh, uh, international tumor board uh, with ABCDE. Today, we'll be doing malignant hematology and transplant. Uh, this is, uh, if I'm counting correctly, this is our 12th tumor board uh, for malignant team and, uh, and transplant, and it's also the 22nd uh, in total. Um, since we started uh, doing this activity three years ago. Um, thank you very much, uh, starting with uh, our case presenters, uh, Dr. Omanar and uh, Dr. Arwa, and uh, we will uh, let Dr. Omanar take over from here. Dr. Omanar, do you have your presentations to share? Yeah, yeah. I'll start oh. now. All right. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. It's always good to see you all. Uh, I'm Manor Hamid, Assistant Lecturer of Medical Oncology at uh, Mansoura University. So uh, case number one. Uh, this is a 26-year-old female patient. Uh, 
Uh, her initial presentation was bilateral breast masses, uh, leukocytosis, and bicytopenia. And it was uh, complicated with uh, tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, her post medical surgery. history of uh, breast cancer uh, in the second degree relative. Uh, she has no allergies and uh, her performance status uh, is one and her total body surface area is 1.5. This is her initial lab. Uh, her total white blood cell count were 21,000. Uh, hemoglobin was eight, uh, microcytic hypochromic and the platelet count uh, was uh, 51,000. Uh, serum creatinine was 8.3. Uric acid was uh, 35. And LDH was uh, 3,585. Uh, and she had uh, hypocalcemia as well, which is classic for tumor lysis syndrome. Is calcium here a different unit? Because it, this isn't high typically in, in how you... Is this a... <laughs> This is low hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So bone marrow aspirate was normal cellular, and there was infiltration by a large number of lymphoid cells with deep basophilic cytoplasm, evacuation, and fine chromatin, a case of Birkitt leukemia slash lymphoma. Uh, bone marrow biopsy showed also infiltration by the same uh, B lymphomatous deposits uh, that uh, is intermediate in size, positive CD20 and focal positive for CD10. And KI67 was 90%. Uh, flow cytometry showed the um, abnormal B cells uh, that expressing CD19, CD79B. It was them for CD10 and CD81. Uh, IgM was them, and uh, there was lambda restriction, and it was negative for CD5, CD23, CD7, CABA, and CD34. Uh, it's a vacature of uh, Birkitt leukemia for translocation 814, uh, uh, and it was positive. So we have Dr. Dahlia with us. Dr. Dahlia, how are you? Hi, Manar, and have... hi, Dr. Muhammad. Hi, everyone. It's very nice hi. to join you today. Nice to meet you, too. So can you tell us something about uh, the flow uh, cytometry of this patient? How do you diag diagnose Birkitt's? And um, is there any way to differentiate between Birkitt lymphoma and the leukemia? Or are, there, are they the same? They express uh, the same surface markers. Okay, I can show you the immunophenotyping for this case, but uh, I need to share my... Uh... I will stop sharing now. Okay. okay. Okay, so as uh, Manar told everyone, the bone marrow smear uh, was normal cellular and it was infiltrated by a large number of lymphoid cells that has deep basophilic cytoplasm, vacuolations, and fine chromatin. Uh, this picture is very typical to Birkitt, but also can, uh, like, uh, could be present in other uh, B cell malignancies. However, uh, the suggestion was uh, it was mostly uh, Birkitt leukemia lymphoma. This is a flow cytometry uh, done on the bone marrow uh, aspirate. Did you share the screen, doctor? We didn't see yeah, it. Yeah, I did. Oh, really? Didn't see it. Okay, let me double check. Can you see it now? Mm, no. Can anyone see it? No, no. It's not okay. No, no. Okay, let me.
think this is a glitch in here. Are you still with me? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let me try it again. Yeah, we see it now. Okay, and this is our case. Can you see it now? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay, so uh, these cells are some cells uh, taken by uh, Samar Abdel Khaled, uh, one of our staff, and uh, this was in the bone marrow aspirate. It shows infiltration of the bone marrow with uh, large size cells with vacuolation, de deeply basophilic cytoplasm, and some sort of fine chromatin. And it was suggestive of uh, Burkitt leukemia lymphoma. And this is a flow cytometry done on the bone marrow aspirate specimen uh, concurrently. And we can see here, this is, is a CD19 on the uh, Y axis. And we can see like a double population of CD19. One with a small forward scatter and a small side scatter, which are the normal B cells. And the red population has a large forward scatter consistent with increased size and also increased side scatter properties, which is um, uh, consistent with increased complexity of cells, like vacuolations, uh, granulations, whatever. But on our case, it's vacuolations. These cells are positive for CD19. However, it's a little bit dimmer than normal B cells. It's dim for CD45. It's negative for CD5, but positive for CD10. As you can see here, it's... Um, with the same expression level of neutrophils, which is our positive control. It has moderate expression of CD79B. It's bright for 81, negative for 23, negative for 34. It appears to have dim IgM, which I don't know, this may be like technical uh, artifact. It should be like more bright than this. And it is lambda restricted. So uh, Manar, is asking what is the difference between Burkitt leukemia and lymphoma. Uh, to be honest, if we if we mention Burkitt, Burkitt is a mature B-cell malignancy. It's not like a precursor B-cell malignancy. But uh, based on historical base, uh, we used to exemplify, to like um, divide the BLL into uh, L1, L2, and L3, which was called Burkitt leukemia. Uh, but this is not applicable anymore. It may have the same uh, appearance, may have the same uh, morphology of the cells, but Burkitt lymphoma is a mature B cell malignancy. So in our case, it is lambda restricted, which is a feature of uh, mature B cells. Uh, it has CD20, but uh, sorry, I, I didn't put it here. It is negative for CD34. So this is completely different, or we cannot call this as precursor B-cell disease. Mm -hmm. So it was very suggestive for Burkitt. However, some of other large B-cell lymphomas may have similar phenotype. It may have like CD10 positive, maybe some vacuolations, uh, maybe IgM. So it's very similar to also uh, some large B-cell lymphomas. Uh, what could uh, differentiate these from each other is translocation 814. Yeah, what about BCL2 and BCL6? Yeah, they are also... BCL6 is not very uh, distinguishing for, uh, for Burkitt lymphoma, but I mean, it could be found, but BCL2 is much better. Yeah, so it's usually BCL6 positive and BCL2 negative, right? BC, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Six, uh, six is better than two, yeah. Okay, and we don't usually see blast cells in Burkitt's because it is mature. 
uh, yes, let us describe this. So by morphology, if you, you, you can like, you can describe this as blast-like cells. Sometimes with aggressive DC lymphoma, it may appear like blasts. So yeah. morphology is not uh, confirmatory in, on this. It, it may be only suggestive for the nature of the cells, but it's not uh, discriminatory between blasts and uh, highly aggressive lymphomas, which may resemble blast cells. Okay, okay. thank you, Dr. Dalia. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Hegazi and Dr. Sameh, Dr. Ali, uh, is there a difference in the management of Burkitt leukemia from Burkitt lymphoma? So, Dr. Munar, before before we, maybe we uh, we have Dr. Alkawaz from pathology as well. We want to um, hear his take as well. And uh, thank you, Dr. Dalia. This was very informative. Dr. Alkawaz, would you would you like to um, um, share some of your thoughts as well? Sure. Um, so, uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I I don't disagree. There may be a, a subtle differences uh, when, of how we look at Burkitt lymphoma here. Uh, Burkitt lymphoma and leukemia um, are exactly the same disease. So oftentimes, uh, when we find a, a lymph node that's involved by Burkitt, it's due to the aggressive nature of the disease, uh, you may find it in the blood and in the bone marrow. And that's why when we diagnose it, we oftentimes will say Burkitt lymphoma-leukemia um, because it's, it's biologically the same disease. Um, now, I think, I think the main um, issue that a lot of people encounter is how do we tell uh, Burkitt from acute lymphoblastic lymphoma-leukemia? Now, let me tell you, by morphologic features, they're indistinguishable. So anybody who tells you, you know, that they're different, no, you can see blasts in Burkitt lymphoma uh, morphologically. Um, and so um, there are differing opinions on whether there is a good way to tell them apart. People, most people agree that the most reliable marker to tell them apart is TDT. Um, so if it's T if the cells are TDT negative, uh, they will navigate more towards um, uh, a lymphoma, a mature lymphoma. If they're TDT positive, they'll call it uh, uh, they'll call it lymphoblastic uh, leukemia. MIC translocations can be seen in lymphoblastic in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but it's also the signature marker uh, um, uh, for um, for a Burkitt. Uh, lymphoma. The light chain expression is a good surrogate marker for maturity, but there are reported cases of acute lymphoblastic lymphoma showing uh, light chain expression. So unfortunately, it's not the end all. And a lot of, we know a lot of acute lymphoblastic leukemias are negative for CD34. Um, so it's, it's, it's something where you have to look at uh, a variety of things. We are more conservative here in calling things Burkitt lymphoma because to us, Burkitt lymphoma is a very specific clinical pathologic entity. And so I, we can't from only a pathology perspective call it Burkitt lymphoma. The clinical aspect of it has to fit in there as well. So what we try to do is call it a high-grade B-cell lymphoma because we know that there is a good amount of DLBCLs and high-grade lymphomas with their MIC translocations that would not otherwise fit into the classification of uh, Burkitt lymphoma. Um, so that's just a few things about how we call Burkitt lymphoma here. Okay, um, we have Dr. Uh, Dr. Nermin is with us, our pathologist. Yes. yes. Hi everyone. How are you? How are you? I'm fine. Okay. Oh, Dr. Dalia, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I'm greatly pleased with this uh, discussion about the Burkitt lymphoma and lymphoblastic lymphoma, and I totally agree that uh, TDT is very important for differentiation. Uh, this is what we rely on in uh, the pathology part. But sometimes in the clinical pathology, I see cases that are diagnosed uh, lymphoblastic that are actually negative for TDT. So uh, I don't know, Dr. Dalia, if uh, this... Uh, you encounter such cases? Say it again. Did you say uh, sometimes we diagnose? Uh -huh. Some cases that are lymph they are diagnosed as lymphoblastic lymphoma. 
although they are TDT negative. I, I have uh, seen some it... cases from the clinical pathology department. Uh, I'm not sure. Is it like uh, reported or just not uh, reported? I mean reported negative or just uh, not mentioned in the report? It's negative. No, it's negative, but you rely on the CD34 more, I think. Um, actually, I didn't encounter such case, but um, maybe it was, I, I, I think it should be TDT positive. So mm. it may be something artifactual. Because I mean, if you be, have the case, is... uh, the case is, is a TDT negative and CD34 positive. Do you sign it out as a lymphoblastic lymphoma? Uh, this is a tricky question. I mean, sometimes <laughs> if we have, yeah, if you have like technical difficulties, you you know the site, we have like two, uh, two, two modules of staining of cells. It's either uh, intracellular or, uh, or surface staining. Sometimes mm -hmm. the cytoplasmic stain or the nuclear stain is very hard, uh, and it cannot show the the real phenotype of the of the cells. So sometimes maybe someone like um, judge on the case collectively. So according to morphology, according to thirty four expression, forty five expression, CD ten negativity of of CD twenty. I mean, like looking at the case collectively and then decide what it could be. And what about KL67? Does it have to be more than 95 or a specific limit to diagnose it as Birkitt? I think this is directed to Dr. Nermin, right? Because we don't do a KI67 on flow cytometry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nermin, are you with us? Did we lose Nermin? Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. I mean, uh, KI sixty seven. Yes, it should be uh one hundred percent, or yeah. close to one hundred percent, like uh ninety eight percent or something like this. Yeah, in this case, it was reported to be ninety. Is that enough? 90, yeah. No, for for me, I have seen it. It's uh, it's uh, no, it's more than ninety percent. Yes. Okay. So just a different take, we do not do KI-67 on acute lymphoblastic lymphomas, um, and uh, we don't rely on any cutoffs for the KI-67. And the reason for that is when you decalcify bone marrows, um, it oftentimes will have um, a negative impact on nuclear staining. And so you might get a lower KI-67 that's just mm. uh, sort of a surrogate of the artifact of, of decalcification. So we don't, mm. we don't have any cutoff, cutoffs here for the lymphoblastic lymphoma. We strictly use it for mature B-cell lymphomas. How about Dr. for Dr. Ha lymphoma? Yeah, I'm sorry, this is Sam. But some, some, Dr. Hawa, sometimes we have like a lymph node biopsy. I mean, you know, you could diagnose mm -hmm. both an ALL or a or a Burkitt's lymphoma from a lymph node biopsy. And most of these cases would have like, you know, a reliable KI-67, which is, you yeah. know, typically, uh, you know, above 95 to 100%. I mean, I agree with you and the bone marrow is not very reliable because of the staining and background. Uh, correct, yes. And and I'm, I'm talking about the majority of cases of ALL are going to be bone marrow biopsies. I mean, I, I want to say probably every 50 bone marrows, you may end up getting one lymph node that has like an actual... Lymph of, and, and that may be my experience here with the University of Louisville. Um, I'm, I'm sure with the pediatric population, they probably get a, get a lot more lymph nodes with ALL. Uh, but when it comes to bone marrows, uh, the KI, and the KI-67 in general, you know, I don't, I don't find it helpful. And, and that may be just my, because with Burkitt, your KI-67 is more than 95%. It's 90% and more. So it, there is there is a lot of overlap between Burkitt and ALL, and I completely agree uh, with uh, Dr. Salem's assessment that at the end of the day, it's really not one marker or another. You kind of look at the whole case. You look at things like 45, you look at Eber expression is another thing that's often helpful. So if you find Eber, it's likely Burkitt and not an acute lymphoblastic lymphoma. Uh, but we have encountered cases that were uh, very, very difficult that we ended up sending it for second opinion to where we couldn't 
they they were so they were in that transition from a Burkitt to an acute lymphoblastic lymphoma. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, Doctor Hawad. So I, I personally, um, you know, every time I, I see this diagnosis of uh, high grade B cell lymphoma, you know, this is the time where I'll, I'll pick up the phone and speak with the pathologist because, as you know, this encompasses a lot of things. You know, it encompasses, you know, Burkitt's. Uh, it could be a double hit lymphoma. It could be a lymphoblastic lymphoma, ALL. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why, you know, I usually am very careful when I see this, you know, high grade B cell lymphoma because it's, just, it's a bit generic. Uh, but I agree with you. I mean, you know, once we discuss, you know, we provide the clinical part. I mean, in this case, it sounds like it's a Burkitt's lymphoma, you know, she's coming in with, you know, uh, TLS and, uh, you know, exploding disease and, uh, make us positive. Uh, I don't know if the TDT was done, but I mean, clinically, it sounds like it's probably a Burkitt's lymphoma. But uh, just, just for everybody, when, you know, when, when we see the, the high-grade B-cell lymphoma diagnosis, uh, it's typically a good time to uh, just speak with your pathologist just to try to, you know, tease out things and uh, provide more info to try to come, you know, come up with a diagnosis. Well, well not, to be, not to be overly negative, but the new classification makes it even more complicated. So I, I don't know if, uh, if you all had the time to look at the new WHO classification, but now instead of saying double hit lymphoma, which used to be all the anything with MIC and BCL2 and BCL6 would be double hit and would fall under the high grade category. Now it's high grade B cell lymphoma dash diffuse large B cell lymphoma with MIC and BCL2. And then the BCL with the suggestion that BCL6 and MIC um, translocated lymphomas are not really high grade because they they tend to do better than those that have MIC and BCL2. So it's it's going to be a lot more compl complex and more confusing, unfortunately. No, no, that's true, but it doesn't encompass the ALLs, right? Like you're not going to see an ALL coming in with you know a. Uh... A, a you know mic rearrangement and BCL two rearrangement, uh, but let me ask you, Doctor Hawass, the is it just the, I think it's both the WHO and the consensus, right? It's uh, the, both classifications took out the BCL six or just the WHO? No, I think it's mostly the WHO. I think the ICCS maintained it, uh, okay. but even the WHO is they're they're not they're not committing their dancing around it. And I can I can share with you the graph that they have of how you know there are subs the reason why they call it dlbcl dash high grade is because there's some that will behave biologically more like dlbcl and others that will behave more aggressively and this is why they're using the both names um but i would imagine that this <laughs> nomenclature is probably um not very helpful for um you know on, on the clinical side um neither it's helpful for clinical trials so we'll, we'll see yeah, but it's they don't say just high grade B cell lymphoma full stop. It's you know it's it's a high grade B cell lymphoma that's diffuse large B cell lymphoma with you know MIC and BCL two yes. rearrangement. That's yes. very that's very different that than when you know you're in a clinic because I just had this exact case like last week where I got the pathology report from our pathologist uh, saying you know high grade B cell lymphoma full stop. And this is when it's like, no, <laughs> we need to, you know, we need to find out, you know, is this a, is this a double hit? Is it a MIC positive? It's negative. Did we do a TTD? All that stuff. And obviously, you know, you know, after, you know, testing and whatnot, it was TTD positive. And then we, you know, then we called it, um, uh, you know, an ALL. and was a pH negative ALL. Basically. It, it, so exactly. It, it's, it's, and and yeah. so I I think I think what what uh, what people get confused about is they're they, in classifications they always um, they always have trash baskets I call them trash baskets it's because when you don't have when you don't know how to classify it you put it under the, under a general category um, and the WHO the old WHO says if you see blastic morphology but you think it's a mature B cell lymphoma you can call it a high grade B cell lymphoma NOS not otherwise specified and then put a comment and say right. We'll we'll update the nomenclature when we get the uh, you know when we get the translocation information. But I I, I personally don't use that at all. Uh, rarely use that because I agree it's confusing. Instead, we use the term aggressive B cell lymphoma, and because to me that also in, encompasses ALL. Uh, but we also try to 
not issue a diagnosis until we have the fish results. So exactly, exactly. Yeah, but just for everybody else, you know, if you see just like a double hit, yeah, you know, I'm sorry, a high grade B cell lymphoma, you just have to understand that this encompasses further things, and it's probably the pathologist is actually doing some additional work. They might be looking at TDT. They might be looking at the fish. They might be looking at the eber. So you just want to speak with them before you actually start treatment based on like a like a pre prelim, uh, because sometimes there could be differences in the management. Yeah. So let me take this chance and ask uh, about the the concept of the new WHO classification is putting everything in families and subfamily and. Um, we are very kind to think about the countries with uh, limited resources. Uh, so if you cannot reach the final diagnosis, you can say like large B-cell lymphoma, not further classified. What about this diagnosis? How do you deal with this? Yeah, I mean, let me, so um, Dr. Hawaz, I'll, I'll leave this up to you, but I just want to make a comment here. So, you know, one the, 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 the one thing that we typically don't want to miss as clinicians is a Burkitt's lymphoma, because if you give a Burkitt's lymphoma, a, you know, if this is called like a, like an aggressive B cell lymphoma or, you know, something along those lines and the clinician automatically, you know, goes for our chop, then, mm -hmm. you know, then you transform a disease that's curable to incurable. These patients will uniformly relapse. Uh, they need much more aggressive therapy than that's just, just our chop. They will universally relapse and it's incurable at that point. So, you know, I think the most important thing is, you know, if, if there is limited resources, it's just to try to make sure if this is a Burkitt's lymphoma or as an ALL, we try to identify that. Everything else, diffuse large B cell lymphomas, e even, you know, even the double hit lymphoma, I mean, you know, say the, because there's really no standard. I mean, mo most of us would do, you know, our epoch, but it's not, you know, terribly wrong if you end up giving, you know, our chop for a, diff for a double hit diffuse large B cell. Uh, but mm -hmm. the other way around, an ALL or a Burkitt's lymphoma, it becomes drastically different when you're managing it. I'm sorry, Dr. Al Hawaz, I'll leave it to you. Okay, thanks. Um, Yes. So um, in those those general, well, well, first of all, I'd like to say that the reason why we have a WHO classification and an ICCS classification is purely political. There are there are two groups that got got in a conflict and they went their different ways. And, and now we're stuck with two classification uh, mm -hmm. with the general classification. What I do when I don't have a test is I am very clear in my comment as to what the differential includes. So going back to uh, Dr. Gabala's um, comment, it's very, very important to when you use a name. So for example, the WHO puts the high grade B cell lymphoma category in there specifically for to sort of alert the clinician that, hey, this is something that might need our epoch more than our chop. And so our role is to be very clear in the differential and say, this is my differential. My differential includes Burkitt. My differential includes ALL, et cetera. And we're doing further workup to tell them apart. Or, you know, it's very difficult at this point to tell them apart and with a justification. So I think as long as the communication is very clear as to when we use a term, what are we meaning in that general category? What does it include? I think that that makes it uh, easier for the clinicians. And, um, uh, personally, I, I all with these, whenever I have an issue like these, I always pick up the phone and, and talk to, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Hemonk, um, uh counterpart to, to sort of talk about, you know, what should we do about this, uh, what my thoughts are, etc. Thanks. Mustafa, can you comment, uh, or any other pathologist on how EBV expression changes your thoughts about the relative diagnosis? Is EBV something associated in any way with ALL in your mind? And how much does it differentiate large cell lymphoma from Burkitt's in your mind? So uh, I've never seen an ALL with, with EBV. I am sure if we Google, we'll find a we'll we'll find a case report where there is EBV and TDT. I hope I I will never see a case like that because quite frankly I would not know what to call it, and it'll likely end up with Elaine Jaffe to uh, render a verdict. Um, but whenever I see EBV, I think more mature. Um, and so, um, so that's a cheap and easy way to help right. differentiate in situations like this because. If there is EBV expression, 
which is often more the case, especially in endemic parts of the world where this is of higher incidence. That's uh, a differentiating feature in your mind, yes? Yes, correct. So it would be something that I would add on to other things to um, favor one, well, to call one versus the other. Yes. The whole phenomenology of Burkitt's lymphoma is interesting in the EBV association. There have been papers now associating that with the origin of Burkitt and a secondary phenomena. There's evidence that EBV upregulates the, uh, sorry, that uh, MYC translocation upregulates the receptor for EBV on the surface of cells and that EBV infection happens to MYC translocated cells, which is the second hit that leads down the road. There's also evidence that there is, once a e cell is infected by EBV, a higher incidence of translocations between MYC and the chromosome 14 because of alterations in the spatial re relationship of those in the nucleus. And then more, more recently, as far as this whole confusion between the World Health Organization and other bodies, uh, there have been better now jobs associated with uh, the molecular understanding of uh, EBV that has divided it into three separate molecular pools. And one of those pools is very importantly distinct from uh, the others in terms of TP53 mutations, not surprisingly. So in that situation, would uh, and that's a particularly bad cohort. So that's a cohort that probably isn't cured with chemotherapy, which is why it's potentially important to uh, differentiate that. And I'm wondering if the clinicians have any comments about that particular fact. I will quickly throw up the literature for those three things that I just mentioned. Thank you, Dr. Ennis. Um, we don't usually routinely do uh, EPER in uh, Burkitt cases. Um, so I'm not sure if there is correlation between it and prognosis in our case. Mustafa, can you comment on whether you think P53 is in any way useful currently with regard to Burkitt? So um, there is plenty of literature actually about uh, P53 immunohistochemistry in every single large cell lymphoma. Well, regardless of EBV expression, um, and it's it, it's been I think it's it's I've I've seen some um, a couple of years ago. There are uh, actually we don't do it routinely, uh, but I know some practices will do it routinely on every single large cell lymphoma. Um, now, just just wanted to also make one point: we do EBV on every single new large cell lymphoma because we think uh, for multiple reasons, um, one of them is, um, the most important of them is, it, to me, it's sometimes an indicative, especially in younger folks, it, it, it's an indicative of the, um, you know, the immune system um, status um, when, when we're not talking about, you know, EBV positive, a large cell lymphoma of the elderly. Got it. So is it in this particular case, is it a useful marker? If, if a patient like this presented, they had, quote, high grade lymphoma, you found they were EBV positive. Would you be more comfortable calling it Burkitt specifically? If it's EBV positive, yes. Yes, got it. And if it was Burkitt and you were calling it Burkitt, um, would you in this day and age look for P53? And would that uh, be helpful as far as a distinction for you know, people like us in terms of making decisions about whether this patient was potentially curable with chemotherapy or not? We don't do that routinely, but I've seen data to support it. Yeah, but Dr. Hawass, so, so not every case of, uh, you know, that's EBV positive is going to be a Burkitt's. I mean, there's diffuse large B-cell lymphomas that could be, you know, EBR positive, right? Of course, yes. In fact, the vast yeah. majority of EBR, EBR, so the vast majority of EBR positive um, lymphomas are not Burkitt. Uh, the vast majority. What I was trying to say is, it the EBR positivity, just by the virtue of rate of EBR positivity in actual Burkitt, makes it more likely for it to be Burkitt versus other types of high-grade B cell lymphomas. So if I don't see, you know. 
does that make sense? Especially with a mic translocation, specifically, right. correct? Right. right, because we do, we do, we do have. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. If you have a mic translocated high grade malignancy and you have EBV with it, you're more commonly thinking this is Burkitt, not large cell. Correct. Yes, that's 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 the point because we have plenty of, again, we thirty uh, percent of large cell lymphomas have mic translocation. So make translocation, while you want to see it in every Burkitt, is by no means specific to Burkitt lymphoma, just like Eber. All right. So did we uh, talk enough pathology, or are we uh, still going to present more on that before we get to the case? <laughs> Well, how are they going to treat this patient clinically? Uh, I think the case presentation hasn't finished yet. I, I oh, think sorry. Got it. Yeah. It, we, we were just enjoying the pathology discussion because th this is very important. Um, was 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 Dr. Nermeen planning to present uh, morphology here or, or no? Mono? I think Dr. Iman has a, a slideshow to present. Oh, okay. Dr. Iman, are you with us? Dr. Nermi, can you start? Okay. Uh... I don't have the presentation actually. It was with uh, Dr. Iman. I don't know yeah. if she's with us or not. Yes, she she has her slides now. We can see it. Can you see it? Oh, yes. Yeah. So as we can see here, uh, this is a hypercellular bone marrow uh, showing diffuse proliferation of uh, uh, medium-sized uh, lymphocytes. And uh, we can see here, um, uh, some apoptotic bodies, okay. Uh, maybe we need higher power. Uh, first, immune stain is for KI67. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I I'm not controlling the, the presentation, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, we can see here KI67 is about uh, maybe more than 95%. Uh, CD20 was the Diffuse positive. Okay, uh, last slide here. Uh, TD3 was negative. TDT was negative also. So, uh, uh, after dividing the clinical picture, uh, of course, it's very difficult to diagnose Burkitt from the, the just from immune histochemistry from the bone marrow alone. So after revising the clinical picture, this case uh, was signed out as a Burkitt lymphoma. Okay. Uh, we should have done the B cell too, but we didn't have it. We should mm -hmm. have done also EB virus. We we do EB virus, but not uh, so frequent. Uh, in our uh, department. Can you uh, just move upward? We don't want to see the name of the patient. So, yeah. <laughs> the presentation is with Dr. Iman, so she can move it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Iman and Dr. Nermeen. I think I will take over now just uh, for the sake of time. Uh, so it seems like there is a, a special IBI score for Perkins uh, that, uh, that has four elements. Uh, if the age is more than 40 and the APOC performance status is equal to or more than two and uh, high LDH more than three times the upper limit of normal and TNS involvement. This is our patient. Um, Nora, one second. Very high LDH. What? Can we just mute who is not speaking? Can you please mute your your mic or Kareem, can you mute all? 
I mean, such a more, um... I'm not sure how to do it. How to mute all. Okay. I think they are muted now. So as as I was just saying, we um, this patient is younger than 40 and she has performance status of one, but she has very high LDH. And later on, we'll find out that she has the CNS involvement. So she has at least intermediate risk and uh, the expected the three year overall survival was 72%, okay? So uh, she she had tumor lysis, so we had to control this first. Uh, she had three sessions of hemodialysis and uh, no raspiricase was needed. Uh, her PET CT unfortunately had extensive disease. Uh, she had the extra nodal and nodal and bone marrow involvement. Um, as Burkitt is high risk for CNS involvement, uh, she has to be screened first. MRI brain was contrast was normal and CSF analysis was free. Uh, so she has uh, two prephases as site reduction, and then uh, the decision was to give her a hypercivad protocol. Uh, course one was received at uh, July 2023, and one month later she had transient symptoms suggesting facial nerve palsy, but uh, it, it recovered on its own. Um, at the time, CT brain and CSF analysis was free, uh, so. She received a course to hybrid CVAD, which contains the methotrexate and RSE. Uh, bone marrow evaluation at that time was free. She, so she, another, another two courses and PET-CT was negative. Everything was very good. Um, after course five hybrid CVAD, uh, unfortunately, she came to the emergency with neurological symptoms. Um, her right eye had ptosis and uh, dilated fixed bubble, so that was suggesting uh, at least uh, oculomotor nerve involvement, uh, trochlear and abducent nerve involvement, and she had also neck stiffness. CT brain was free, but uh, CSF analysis showed heavy infiltration of immature lymphoid cells, suggesting Burkitt. Uh, cells in the CSF, um, uh, total protein, uh, white blood cell count, and sugar in the CSF were normal, and flow of the CSF uh, confirmed that it was uh, in involvement by malignant Burkitt disease. Um, but her bone marrow aspirate and biopsy were free, and also her CT evaluation were free. So this is isolated CNS relapse. Um, the decision at that time is to give was to give her high dose mesotrexate uh, at 3.5 gram per meter square and uh, RC 2 gram per meter square was uh, twice weekly triple intracecal. Um, after the first cycle, she had fits, so she was admitted to the ICU. Uh, her CSF was free; electrolytes were normal. Um, her neurological symptoms. Are controlled now, but uh, apart from ptosis, uh, dilated fixed dried pupil, and there was also proximal myopathy, maybe related to uh, steroid use. Um, HLA matching was bending, so um, we want to talk a little bit about how to manage her. So uh, generally speaking, if the case is high grade, Burkitt aggressive, multiple extra lymphatic site, we know that Burkitt. Uh, uh, the bone marrow is not indicated at CR1, but if the patient has aggressive presentation, would you consider doing bone marrow transplant at CR1 or not? Dr. Gabala, what's your take? Uh, yeah, so we we typically don't uh, uh, take these patients to uh, autos for uh, in, in CR1 because, you know, as, as you pointed out, the... Uh, you know, the majority of patients can be uh, potentially cured uh, just with chemotherapy. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it's so so this is a primary refractory case, right? She hasn't even finished the hyper CVAD and she she had progressive disease. But I wanted to ask you, so is it only CNS, is it CNS progression or does she also have systemic uh, disease? No, she has only CNS now. Her bone marrow okay. is free and her, she didn't do new bit but uh, she did the whole body set CT and it was free. And it was what? It was free. No, but she has CNS involvement now, right? Yeah, just CNS. 
So it's an isolated CNS uh, disease. Yeah. Got it. And then in the when she was getting uh, getting the induction with the hyper CBAT, so she was getting both like you know one A and one B, and like where was she in the treatment when she presented with the CNS relapse? Uh, yeah, she she has um, she had course one which include uh, uh, anthracyclines and vincristin, the usual course one and course two has um, mesotrexate and citrobine, but uh, mesotrexate is in a lower dose, one gram per meter square, and RST was I think was three gram per meter square so this is another question i want to ask um, do you agree on the 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 the, the regimen the high dose mesotrexate rsc as she received it before in course two but this time is in larger dose do you think it would be effective or should we switch to other agents uh yeah no so we should probably uh uh switch uh, the problem is the, uh, so I don't know, I mean, Dr. Hagazi, so the, you know, patients with uh, with this, uh, with primary refractory Burkitt's, uh, or at least just with CNS disease, uh, those typically don't uh, do well. Uh, I don't know if you've had, I mean, for, for you know, for this case, it's, a, it's, it's a, you know, the patient is, uh, it's just like an isolated CNS disease, but uh I mean, for this case, I probably would have would would do something else other than the methotrexate um, uh, RSC, but I uh, it's it's a tough situation. Yeah, it's a it's it is a difficult disease, and and salvage here uh, with, with isolated CNS is uh, is is not the easiest. I wonder, uh, Doctor Emmons, uh, what would be your take? This is a patient who hasn't yet finished hyper CVAD. And the CNS is the only involved site. They were getting uh, hyper CVAD um, appropriately doses, dosed, and the relapse is isolated. So this is not a mass lesion. It's just CSF relapse, correct? Yeah, yes. And, yeah, uh, it's, it's a primary program. Yeah, primary track. The HIV was tested and, and negative in this patient, correct? HIV, yeah, negative. Negative, got it, yeah. There's a much higher incidence in HIV positive patients of this happening, but uh, certainly a, an aggressive course of chemo to clear the CSF would be appropriate, you know, a couple of uh, doses every week uh, until the uh, lesions were cleared. Now, even with that, the, the long-term results in these patients are not great. And again, this may have been one of these cohort of patients that had this, you know, background P53 um, mutation, which marks patients like this at being higher risk for any kind of intervention up front. So maybe we'll be doing that in the future in terms of looking at this and screening for this and deciding who needs to early go to things like, and I realize this is not necessarily what happens in Egypt, but CAR-T in this country, you know, uh, considerations for more aggressive immunologic therapy earlier for patients like this who have high risk and not necessarily going into remission long-term with transplant. Uh, or, or uh, chemotherapy, as we're seeing in large cell lymphoma, and there's many lessons to be learned in Burkett's, which is a smaller group of patients from the large cell lymphoma patients, are being screened earlier and earlier for whether they're going to be chemosensitive or not, and then making decisions about when uh, to place them on things like, um, you know, um, uh, CAR T's and other sort of uh, more advanced immunologic therapies. I'm curious uh, at Moffitt what you guys. Uh, would do with patients like this. So I, you know, we would clear, we, I would typically recommend, you know, clearing the disease with aggressive uh, intrathecal chemotherapy, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is a good long-term strategy for these folks. Yeah, no, I mean, we don't have a good strategy because the, uh, as, as I mentioned, for most of these uh, patients, I mean, we've tried CAR-T as well. Uh, we, we've not had a single patient who actually had a long-term, you know, good outcome. Um, it's just in this specific situation, it's not a primary refractory disease. I, you know, I want, I mean, our, our, uh, our standard is typically, uh, you know, for, even for the part B is, uh, is 3.5, you know, grams per meter squared, uh, from, from the get go. Uh, so it's an, you know, it's just an isolated, uh, it's like, you know, sanctuary site, uh, the CNS, but, um, you know, so may, so maybe the high dose methotrexate would you know can lead to you know some responses with with the RSC and the triple therapy, uh, but uh, unfortunately, you know the, these patients, I mean, um, you know they, they don't do well. CAR T doesn't do well. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it, you know, even when I was in Philadelphia, um, 
you know, th these cases we sometimes even, you know, send to, to hospice. Um, but in this specific situation, it's because it's just a sanctuary CMS disease. You, you know, I, I think it's uh, feasible to, you know, do high dose methotrexate and, uh, and uh, you know, intrathecal and see if that clears up the CNS. And then the question is, you know, if it clears up, you know, what, what do you do then? You know, do you consolidate with like a thiotipa based uh, auto transplant or, you know, even an allogeneic transplant? Uh, but there's really no standard of care in this situation, and you're not going to get a uniform answer from, uh, you know, even the same people within the same department. There's an additional concern I have in this particular case in that the patient has been getting aggressive therapy and yet still has a ptosis and a blown pupil on one side, which suggests that this involvement is beyond just the CSF itself and involves potentially the optic nerve and or other sanctuary sites beyond just the central nervous system per se. Because if the optic nerve or the optic orbit uh, was involved, that is a level of complication beyond the sanctuary site of the central nervous system fluid. And uh, dosing to the central nervous system fluid isn't going to be enough in that circumstance. Now, as to whether mm -hmm. you know you radiate the eye or the optic nerve in addition to this, again, we're in uncharted territory. But I'd be more concerned, um, and you know, a um, a contrast MRI may be helpful in terms of defining that um, uh, if we need to go that route. Yeah, she did a contrast MRI and it didn't show. Uh, okay, uh, so was answer. it GAD and without? Was it done both way with gadolinium and without uh, both times it was done in the past? Gadolinium, uh, it was pre and both contrast MRI. Okay, yes. So it was it, it was done the first time and the second time. Both were done yeah. that way. It never showed the evidence. It was the CSF analysis that showed the evidence. Yeah, and now the CSF is clear, but she has the same. Yeah, improved the neurological symptom, but it's still evident, especially in the eyes. So, sh do you consider her now in remission, or, or should you wait till the neurological symptoms disappear completely? Did the patient undergo an ophthalmologic evaluation of the retina? The retina? Yes. Did Did anybody look in the eye uh, to to look specifically as to whether there might be lymphomatous involvement in the orbit? That sometimes uh, doesn't show up I don't on think MRI. That happened. Yet, uh, an ophthalmologic uh, evaluation can sometimes show you something that's suspicious for that. Again, it worries me that this person, uh, despite therapy, still has a ptosis, which is not an orbit issue, but has a blown pupil. You said on the one side, correct? So there's an, a pupillary involvement here. I mean, a yeah. pupillary defect here. Yeah, that's that's very worrisome for you know ocular involvement. And I wanted to ask another question uh, as we are uh, contemplating therapy in this patient with isolated CNS involvement and um, peripheral, uh, no evidence of disease. Um, what about irradiation, craniospinal irradiation for a patient who is, has um, that level? I agree. I think what I would do is I would do a high dose methotrexate since the patient was getting one gram before, I would give him three and a half or four grams. The patient is young, the kidneys hopefully has recovered nicely. Uh, they should be able to get that to um, uh, affect, um, to control uh, CNS from relapse. But how about craniospinal irradiation in these um, isolated CNS with benefits of um, additional systemic therapy that is not CNS beneficial is, is unlikely to um, uh, sustain any benefit. This is to, to everybody who wants to uh, participate uh, from our oncologists, the question. Yeah, yeah sorry, Dr. Higazi, I had to step out for, for a second. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so for the craniospinal, I mean, uh, you know, you could definitely try that. The, the problem is, you know, first, you know, it's obviously, you know, quite morbid. These patients uh, have a lot of cognitive issues. Um, I have personally, uh, you know, seen patients like this where they get a transient response and then, you know, they later on progress. Uh, but it's de definitely, I mean, you know, the... The CNS modalities are, you know, high dose methotrexate, uh, you know, RSC, intrathecal, 
um, radiation. Uh, some people sometimes get responses with like a brutinib for uh, CNS lymphomas. Uh, but otherwise, it's an area of um, CAR T cell has activity there. But the problem is, you know, if it's, it's if it's Burkitt's, uh, you know, even CAR T cell therapy doesn't really have, you know, good outcomes. So th th this patient will unfortunately, you know, not going to have very great outcomes here. Yeah. yeah, I myself am very worried about ocular involvement because that's a privileged site and it gets very different levels of methotrexate than the central nervous system in high dose methotrexate. Therefore, that's a situation that I'd be much more amenable to the idea of radiation of some sort, either of the orbit on one side or both sides. And again, if there was possible, I'd get an ophthalmologic evaluation formally for this patient. And, and this patient, uh, just to answer Dr. Delia's uh, question, this patient was giving rituxan, right, as part of the hypersevet? No, no. Hmm. Um, no, no sponsorship for it, unfortunately, in Burkett. We give it in diffuse large beyond. Around. Right. Oh, uh, okay. I see. I see. Do you think so, it would make a huge difference? Uh, I think rituxan can make a difference. Um, that's why we use it. Um, in, in this setting, it, it could have made a difference since the patient originally, uh, I, I would assume, didn't have the evidence of the involvement. Um, this disease was, 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 was very positive for uh, was CD20, you know, uh, right. So, um, yeah, it, I, I don't know what, what um, Dr. Gabala and Dr. Emmons think, but I, I would think that would have, I, it's hard to tell if it would have, been, but I, I would think I, I would have wanted to use it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and maybe try to get it interesting too. There's retrospective data in the United States that rituximab helps in survival overall of Burkitt's, but there's not evidence that I'm aware of that it alters CNS disease particularly, but it does improve survival overall. Yeah. So yeah, Doctor Des. Yeah, I'm um, sorry about that. Oops, like, uh, in here. Uh, yeah, I. I mean, rituxan. Yes, we typically do it, but I don't think it would have. You know. Uh, you know, I agree with Doctor Emmons. I don't think it would have pre prevented necessarily the CNS disease. Um, I think this is, you know, uh, inevitable. I guess that. But let me ask you. You know, Doctor Hegazi and Emmons, for the hyper C bed for these cases, do you typically do for the Part B, uh, like you know the one gram per meter squared or the 3.5 uh, milligram per meter squared? I mean, we typically do the 3.5. Um, so in, in, in our centers, hyper -C -Vet is is given one gram. In a case like this, it, it, it would have been a high risk of CNS involvement, especially with all the extra nodal involvement of the disease. Um, it would have been worth it, but I don't think we use in a standard the three point five grams in in the B cycles. We we use the one the the two hundred then eight hundred, yeah. which is one mm -hmm. gram. Yeah, which was all the published. Yeah. yeah. So, what conditioning regimen would you choose for this patient? You mean if there's not going to be any conditioning? And, you know, with, without getting into remission, uh, which is, you know, going to be hard, uh, it's it's going to be tough. But uh, a thiotip, I mean, if you do get into remission, you know, a thiotip, a base regimen, you know, for, for CNS penetration would probably be the way to go. Dr. Hagazi, what would you do? Yeah, I tend to agree, but I, I would want to look more in the, in the um, in, again, it, with the persistence of the symptoms, Despite the CSF, as you know, the CSF you're sampling, um, well, not the ocean, but maybe a, a pond. So it not, not always going to be representative. So with the persistence of the symptoms, maybe we should look more uh, a dedicated orbital MRI and ophthalmologist evaluation. Um, there is something that is uh, leading to this uh, patient's uh, neurological deficit not to um, recover. That, that, that is making it concerning that even if you don't see it positive on CSF, that, that the problem is, is not yet under control. Yeah. So it has to be returned to normal. Or, or, or at least improve in a sense, 
but but not 100%, uh, not, not to be having a dilated and fixed pupil, uh, you don't you don't have an explanation then what 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 is happening here the csf is negative but the the patients uh, still uh, um, pupils are not reactive something is not right yeah okay so um... yeah, i don't know what dr emmons think i i would agree with dr gavala i would use a thiotepa based as we use for the cns uh, lymphomas as our uh, conditioning regimen, and it would be autologous, not allogeneic. But again, just to emphasize again, the orbit is a privileged site beyond the central nervous system. It is privileged for all the drugs we're talking about. High dose methotrexate, thiotepa, all of them don't get in as well as they do to the standard CSF. So if there's mm -hmm. orbital or optic nerve involvement, that demands a separate thought and probably is more uh, specifically along the line of at least local radiation to the orbit, if not, you know, considerations of TBI as part of whatever regimen you're going to do, if you're going to do a uh, transplant regimen for this patient. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, did the, did the patient clear this, the, the CSF already? Yeah. Yeah, it's clear oh. now. Oh, I see. But but I thought she was still having symptoms and seizures and whatnot, no? She no, still has the atosis and dilated fixed. The seizures yeah. cleared. The two things that are left no are the seizures and the ptosis. Which again, very uh, the eye symptoms important. still there. Got it. Did ophthalmology like do like an uh, like a fundus exam and just make sure there's no like you know retinal or optic nerve involvement or something or no or an MRI I'm of the orbit? Sure. I'm not sure if they done this. I will check. Okay. I mean, if her if symptoms are getting better, she's cleared up her CSF. Uh, I completely agree with Dr. Emmons. I would do like an MRI of the orbit and have uh, ophthalmology see her. And, uh, you know, if you want to do like a radiation either to the orbit, or, I mean, you'll have to talk with the radiation oncologist uh, if even she could get like a craniospinal and then uh, go for transplant. But it's, it's going to be very toxic. How, how old is she? 26. Oh, 26. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could, you could definitely give it, a, give it a shot. But I would definitely, you know, agree with, the, you know, that, uh, you know, getting maybe radiation and... Uh, you know, ophthalmology involved would would probably be uh, the way to go. Yeah, but if she's planned for craniospinal irradiation, is is it better to do uh, collecting stem cells before going into radiation? Yeah, that's. If you're going to do a transplant, you can collect stem cells certainly any time yeah. before this, yeah. and certainly uh, you'd you'd want to avoid irradiating the axial skeleton before doing that if you're going that route. Again, the the more important distinction, as everybody's pointing out, is to really define what's going on in that eye, uh, uh, because that is going to be a privileged site that requires special care. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Arwa, are you with us? Do we have time for the second case? That's the problem. <laughs> that, that's the problem. We're, this is a tough case, uh, wonderful coverage from pathology and, uh, and uh, from the uh, clinical side. Should we um, reconvene again in a month rather than uh, continue? Because I don't want to keep people longer because everybody, I'm sure, has other plans in the middle of the day. Okay. Uh, how about that? Why don't we, uh, Dr. Arwa, I know you, you did a good job uh, putting the presentation together, but maybe we keep it as is and we reconvene. We will um, send an invitation with a time and date to see that works with everyone. And I think 2 p.m. Eastern time in on Sundays uh, works okay with uh, your schedule um, in Egypt as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just because, you know, we're 10 minutes after three and uh, and we have two cases, maybe we can use those two cases for next um, tumor boards um, uh, gathering. And we'll shoot for um, early uh, February. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. In Egypt. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful uh, presentation from all aspects, uh, Dr. Amanar, Dr. Adalia, Dr. Nermin, as well as uh, Dr. Iman. Um, and we will try to blur out the name uh, before we... Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank Bye. you too.